You're listening to FOJC Radio, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and teaching the doctrine of Christ to the whole world. Good evening and welcome to Friday Night FOJC Remnant Gathering. Grab your Bible and your pens and your paper, and when two or three are gathered in His name, the Lord is right here with us. So thank you for joining us, and here's Brother David. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the May 21st, 2021 edition of the FOJC Remnant Gathering. I am David Carrico, and I am so honored that each and every one of you are joining us for the broadcast this evening. Our study for this evening is going to be Puritan Spiritual Warfare, the Breastplate of Righteousness, and we are so glad for everyone that is joining us for this study. We have a lot of things to pray about, as always, so many things, and we can only mention a few um, every broadcast, but an old friend of mine from our old hometown, Ken Tucker, uh, we just got a call this afternoon from his wife. He's our visiting Ken, evangelist. Ken, yeah, he actually um, has a license through our ministry. He's a um, just an old friend, and he was... Larry Norman's lead guitar player and during the last years of Larry Norman's life if any of you that know music you'd know Larry Norman uh, he was inducted into the gospel music hall of fame the same time Elvis was he was quite a guy and we got to know Larry uh, somewhat because of Ken but he's an old friend and a real good guy and he's hurt badly after an automobile accident so um we're going to pray for Ken. And uh, there's also, we want to continue to remember Samantha. She's a teenager that has been abused. And that is such a sad thing when that happens. And it happens all too much. We want to pray about all of the people that are being born again and coming for baptism. I really feel something extraordinary happening here it's more than just good things happening it's feeling more and more like a genuine move of the spirit of god and when you see so many people born again with such frequency uh, it's really a tremendous indication that the spirit of god is really moving um we want to pray for everetta she has eyesight and other health issues. And we, Luetta. And who? Luetta. Luetta. Okay, excuse me. Luetta. And we want to pray for her for eyesight and other health issues. Uh, we also want to pray for all of the people that are moving to the area. And it's honestly hard for me to keep up with. Uh, it, it is just amazing. Uh, the things that are happening and uh, we're just so thankful to the Lord uh, for all that he's doing and uh, we're just so thankful to him so let's go to the Lord in prayer father we do thank you once again for this chance to preach your word and to lift up our concerns to you and there are always so many and for my friend Ken father please touch him and be with him during this time of pain and we just pray, Father, that you heal him and lift him up from this this accident. And, Father, be with Marsha and with the whole family. And just touch him, please, in Jesus' name. We do want to pray, Father, for uh, Luetta, for her eyesight and for her other health issues. And, Father, we just pray that you just bless all of those that are wanting to come here and father if they're meant to be here let them get here and if they're not just you know you're the boss and you can put the stops to it we want to pray father about all the people that have been coming for salvation and baptism that you will just mightily bless them and that you'll just keep them in your perfect will father we thank you every time we see the miracle of new birth and father it's it's such a joy 
when we see people born into your kingdom, and especially when we've been seeing so many marvelous things happen. So, Father, we just thank you so much for that. And, Father, we want to pray for this teaching tonight that you'll just help me deliver it in simplicity and truth. And we just give you the praise for every good thing that is happening. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Worship the Lord for just a few moments, and we will be back with our study for this evening, Puritan Spiritual Warfare, The Breastplate of Righteousness. We're sorry, but because of copyright rules, you cannot hear my music. However, if you want to hear the message in its entirety with my music, you can join us on the radio page on Friday nights for the live audio broadcast at 6 p.m. Central Time, or you can listen on our podcast page at fojcradio.com. Here's Brother David. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter 6 and verse 14. And as we always do when we study Puritan spiritual warfare, we will be referring frequently tonight to The Christian in Complete Armor by William Gurnall. And we're also going to be hearing from others that speak to this topic. And this is a very, very important topic as everything in Scripture is. And certainly uh, in the realm of spiritual warfare, we're in it, so you better be able to do it. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with the truth. And we've talked about the belt of truth uh, in our last study. And having on the blessed breastplate of righteousness. And that's going to be our focus for the study for this evening, the breastplate of righteousness. And in the Christian in Complete Armor by William Grinnell, I want to read the definition that he gives of righteousness, and we're going to be exploring that and meditating upon that throughout this study. He says, and this is on page 407, now this also is twofold, a righteousness imputed or imparted. And we're going to be understanding the difference between imputed righteousness and imparted righteousness. He goes on, the imputed righteousness is that which is wrought by Christ for the believer. The imparted, that which is wrought by Christ in the believer. The first of these, the imputed righteousness, is the righteousness of our justification, that by which the believer stands just and righteous before God. And the second righteousness is the righteousness of our sanctification. And that is the primary focus of our study for this evening. Now, we want to understand imputed righteousness. And uh, when we are justified, we've done a a doctrine of Christ on justification not long ago, and we talked about this at some length. And it's something we really need to understand what imputed righteousness is. And basically, when we are justified by faith in the death of Christ upon the cross for us, righteousness is imputed to us, and we are declared not guilty before God by virtue of of our repentance and faith in the gospel. Now, in Romans chapter 4, let's begin in verse 6. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. And this is a very simple proposition. Righteousness is imputed to us when we repent of our sins and we cover them with the blood of Christ. And the best way always to understand scripture is by the doctrine of Christ. 
by all means, first and foremost. And also by letting Scripture interpret Scripture. And in Romans chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, the Apostle Paul was quoting the 32nd Psalm. And this exactly gives us the understanding of imputation. In Psalm 32 and verse 1, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Forgiveness covers our sin with the blood of Christ. In verse 2, Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. The man that does not have iniquity imputed unto him is the person that has been forgiven and is walking without guile before the Father. Now, like everything, this has been perverted. And it has been perverted by those that say that the imputed righteousness of Christ means that Christ obeyed the law for you and that the perfect obedience of Christ is imputed to you. Therefore, uh, Christ obeyed the law for you. Therefore, you don't have to obey. And oh boy, this is so silly. But it's out there and it's out there big time. So we're going to have to talk about that. Uh, just a little bit. Now, John Wesley, he had this to say, and uh, this is on page 238 of volume 5 of his works. He says, But in what sense is this righteousness imputed to believers? In this, all believers are forgiven and accepted, not for the sake of anything in them, or of anything that ever was, that is, or ever can be done by them, but wholly and solely for the sake of what Christ hath done and suffered for them. I say again, not for the sake of anything in them or done by them or their own righteousness or works. We are justified freely by his grace, and that means we're forgiven. And when we come to Christ for forgiveness, sin that we committed and we've repented of, that sin is no longer imputed unto us. And our breastplate of righteousness, this is the righteousness that is imputed to us, and we're going to see beyond that, it's the righteousness of obedience. And this is our breastplate. And you know, if you don't have your breastplate on, this is what's in front of you the most. When you're going into the battle, you can't be brave without a breastplate. And a lot of people are like uh, they have a bulletproof vest that's made out of cotton that ain't going to stop anything. And there's a false holiness and a false breastplate that people are going out in that it's going to absolutely get them slaughtered. And I want to read a little bit from a book entitled Scriptural Freedom from Sin by Henry Brockett, who is, I really like this guy. And way back in the day, and I, this book was first published in 41, and he debated a guy by the name of Ironsides, Harry Ironsides. And he was the man that brought dispensationalism into Moody Bible College. And that was, of course, much to the destruction of uh, and to the leavening of the whole institution. And Henry Brockett debated Ironside over this issue of imputed righteousness. And Henry Brockett said, and this is just another one of the stinking, disgusting things about dispensationalism, and it's sending people to hell. It absolutely is. And it's giving people a false breastplate. And I want to under help us all to understand a little bit just exactly how they're doing it. But in Saul, or on page 155 here of Mr. Brockett's book, he says, Thus Dr. Ironside teaches that this position of imputed holiness is reckoned by God to all Christians, whatever their actual state be, be they carnal or spiritual. And this is exactly what they say, that once you've ever believed Christ and have had the righteousness of Christ imputed to you, well, sin can no longer be imputed. And it doesn't matter how you really are living, God only sees the righteousness of Christ. And I never will forget my first introduction into this doctrine. And Don and I were visiting a church in Evansville, 
and they had a testimony time. And this one lady gets up and she says, thank God that he can't see me when I sin. He only sees Jesus. And I'd never heard nothing like that. And I thought, man, what is this all about? But this is all about the dispensational doctrine. And it, we can take it back even farther than that to John Calvin. And he said that uh, this is the way it is. Christ obeyed the law of force. Mr. Brockett goes on here. And uh, quoting uh, Mr. Ironsides, he says, God looks at them as he looks at his son. And this is just really, really silly. Now, let's just look at a couple of scriptures that it would behoove these good folks to look at. And uh, let's look at the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. <laughs> and boy, let's all say amen right now. There's no creature that's not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. God can see you when you sin. He can see you at all times. And this doctrine is just a damnable doctrine of the devil. It's just all that it is in making people think that they have a free license to sin and nothing will come from it. In James chapter 3 and verse 6, verse 14, the scripture says, But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This has to go. It has to go. Don't lie and think you're right with God when you're not. God can see us all. And this is such a sad, sad situation, and it's so absolutely ridiculous. Mr. Brockett goes on to say, to imagine that if there are pride in, envy, unbelief, and uncleanness in our hearts. Yet, because we are Christians, God sees us in Christ and reckons us to be as humble, loving, believing, and pure as he is, is to imagine that the God of absolute truth thinks something about us which is false and, in effect, makes Christ the minister of sin. May we all be delivered from such Holiness, the false, as he calls us. And that's what this is. This is holiness, the false. This is the false breastplate. This is the breastplate that's made out of paper mache and phony righteousness. And that's what we have to do. We have to understand that if we have the real righteousness of Christ, we can be brave. We can be bold as a lion. But if we're trying to fight this battle with some kind of a phony breastplate, we're going to go down. Um, I want to read something from Jonathan Fletcher, and he was John Wesley's friend, and he uh, worked with Wesley in the 1700s, so this thing's been around a long time. And Jonathan Fletcher had this to say about it. He said, The personal righteousness of Christ is not so much as once mentioned in all the Bible. Amen. And, you know, I've said oftentimes that the uh, American church are the champions of preaching and believing what's not in the Bible. He goes on to say, is not so much as mentioned once in all the Bible with the doctrine of imputation, and yet some divines can make whole congregations of men who believe the imputation of Christ's personal personal righteousness is a scriptural doctrine and the very moral of the gospel. And just think of that. There is not one word about this in scripture, and yet these people, they make a doctrine of it, and beyond that, a doctrine that is enabling people to live any way they want. It's literally sending people to hell. He says, this garment of their own weaving, you see, there is a blessed prate of righteousness, and there is a garment that men weave themselves. He says, a garment of their own weaving. They cast over adulterers and murderers 
and then present the filthy, bloody wretches as complete in Christ's obedience, perfect in righteousness, and undefiled before God. And that's literally what these people are doing. People that are living in all kinds of sin, and they weave this false breastplate of imputed righteousness, and they want to throw it over them and declare them holy and righteous in Christ. And certainly, their absurd and vain ramblings does not make it so. On page 409, William Gurnall talks about true righteousness and the true bless, breastplate. He said, true holiness doth not divide what God joins together. God spake all these words, first table and second also, referring to the first and second table of the Decalogue of the Ten Commandments. Now a truly sanctified heart dares not skip or blot one word God hath written, but desires to be a faithful executor to perform the whole will of God. And when our heart is thus so with him, we have the true breastplate of righteousness. But you cannot have the breastplate of righteousness without first the imputed righteousness of Christ at our justification and second, with the actual righteousness of sanctification and obedience working in our lives. And righteousness basically means that, in that sense, doing what is right. We have to do what is right to be righteous before the Father. In First John 2 and 4, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. And this is so, so very true. Now, I want to read something from Mr. Gurnall on page 407 at the bottom of the Christian in complete armor. And he puts it rightly thus. He says, The righteousness, therefore, which is here compared to the breastplate, is the latter of the two. And that is the righteousness of our sanctification, which I called a righteousness imparted, or a righteousness wrought by Christ in the believer. Now this take thus described, it is a supernatural principle of new life planted in the heart of every child of God by the powerful operation of of the Holy Spirit. And let me read that again. That's exactly what we're talking about. That is so good. It is a supernatural principle of a new life planted in the heart of every child of God by the powerful operation of the Holy Spirit. Now, let's see that in Scripture. In the epistle of Second Peter, chapter 1 and verse 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. When we become a partaker of the divine nature, the Bible says that when we're born again, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us. 1 Corinthians 3.16, 6.19, Romans 8 and 9. And also... Jesus taught that if we would believe him and keep his commandments and obey his words, that not only he would manifest himself unto us, John 14, 21, but also that the Father would also come and make his abode with us. Can you imagine the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost will dwell in your heart? Now, if that doesn't give you enough to get it done, I don't know what will. That's what we mean by becoming a partaker of the divine nature, that that divine nature actually dwells in you and empowers you. And it is through the agency of the Holy Spirit that we are sanctified and set apart and enabled to do. You see, imputed righteousness is something God does in, in the third heaven. He declares us righteous and not guilty of all of our past sins because of our faith in Christ. And then there is a righteousness imparted into our hearts by the very nature of God, whereby we are changed and enabled to live a righteous life before him. And certainly it's never 
any such thing where we won't mess up, but we will have a heart that we want to obey God. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2, it says, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit. There it is. It's the sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience. And the sanctification of the Spirit will lead to obedience. This is the breastplate of righteousness and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. You can't forget that because it's the blood sprinkled upon us that is that gives us righteousness to begin with and is the blood sprinkled upon us that continues to enable us to walk a life of obedience unto the Father. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Amen. Grace and peace unto us all indeed be multiplied. And in the book of Colossians, I want to read the the epistle of Colossians, the third verse, third chapter and the tenth verse, and I want to read something else that John Wesley said. This is on page 241 here. He had a sermon that uh, it was called The Lord Our Righteousness, and it's really a dandy. But he says this. He says, They to whom the righteousness of Christ is imputed are made righteous by the Spirit of Christ. Now, that is something we really need to believe and understand, the sanctification of the Spirit. This isn't just something to say, oh, I'm sanctified by the Spirit. This is something that changes you. It gives you a heart to obey God, and it gives you the Spirit of God that enables you to do so. Romans 8 and 2 said, The law of the Spirit of life in Christ has set me free from the law of sin and death. And that's the only thing that can. They to whom the righteousness of Christ is imputed, quoting Brother Wesley, are made righteous by the Spirit of Christ. They are renewed in the image of God after the likeness wherein they were created in righteousness and true holiness. Not holiness the false, as Brother Brockett said, but holiness the true with people that are really changed and born again and walking in obedience before the Father. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 10, and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. And this is what new birth and imputed righteousness is. It will also impart that righteousness unto us by the very nature of God, whereby we will be enabled to serve him. And you see, this is what's out front. This is the breastplate. If we don't have this breastplate of righteousness on, you're not going to be able to go into battle. And if you're not going into battle, you don't need a breastplate. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 32, the scripture says this, and we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. Yes, the Holy Ghost is given unto them that obey him. So what is given to them that don't? I'll let you figure that one out. But you know it's not going to be anything good, is it? Now, I want to talk a little bit. Uh, There was a section Uh, And we're going to talk about boldness, and we're going to talk about uh, going to war with the breastplate. And the the book, Christian in Complete Armor, this is a huge book. If you've ever seen it, I mean, this is a book. And it's only about that, those few verses in Ephesians. And this section on the breastplate of righteousness is huge in, in this book, and it's all good. And, of course, we can only bring out a few things here. Uh, but it is all good, and uh, if you read it, you would be nothing but blessed. But in Second Peter chapter 3, and verses 3 and 4, there is a group of people, and Gurnall goes into a section, and he talks about people that we have to deal with, and with our uh, breastplate, and do war with. And he talks about the mockers and the scoffers. And um, in Second Peter chapter 3, and verse 3, Knowing this first, that there shall come some in the last days, scoffers, 
walking after their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Now, I talk to people a lot about the return of the Lord and about the situation of the world and about our need to be able to be ready for this. And I get a lot of mocking and a lot of scoffing. And, you know, people will, and what a mocker is, it's like a mocking bird. They'll just kind of repeat back to you and make light and make fun. And uh, they're mockers and they're scoffers. They don't believe that the Lord is returning soon, and they scoff and they make fun of it. And uh, these are some of the people that are really uh, some of the people we got to deal with. Now, in the epistle of Jude, in the epistle of Jude, I want to read verses 17 through 19. And there's just some really neat things here that Brother Grinnell had to say. And... In the epistle of Jude, beginning in verse 17, But, beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit. We talked about those that are born again that have the Spirit. Romans 8 and 9. Uh, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is none of, he, none of his. And these are not Christians. They do not have the Spirit, but they are mockers. And it says here, it's interesting, that they separate themselves. And I want to read what Brother Grinnell had to say on this on page 471 here. And he said this, and he's quoting William Perkins. And I quote William Perkins a lot, uh, the father of Puritanism. And here we see uh, the impact that Perkins had upon Grinnell and upon all the Puritans. But he says this, The Spirit of God tells us of a new gang that shall mock at holiness under a color of holiness. Now these people in Jude, they were presenting themselves as Christian and holy, and they were separating themselves, yet they did not have the Spirit of God at all. Listen to what Brother Perkins had to say. He said, uh, and this is Grinnell quoting Perkins, he said, Learned Master Perkins reads these words thus, These be sect makers, fleshly, not having the Spirit. Sect makers, those that separate themselves, do not our hearts tremble to see the mocker's arrow shot out at this window? These are they who pretend more to purity of worship than others and profess they separate on account of their conscience because they cannot suffer themselves so much as touch them that are unclean by joining with them in holy ordinances. And they mockers, they fleshly, truly, if the Spirit of God had not told us this, we should have gone last into their tent. And this is just so true. And absolutely, the Word of God tells us that we are to separate from pagan worship and idolatry, but we have to be careful with getting, as we're going to look at this scripture also, holier than thou. And unfortunately, we see this too. And this is also not the work of the Spirit of God. In Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 24, proud and haughty scorner is his name. What's his name? Proud and haughty scorner, who dealeth in proud wrath. And this just had such a, I mean, this is just a scripture, isn't it? Proud and haughty scorner is his name, who dealeth in proud wrath. There's a real connection between the wrath that people want to deal out against God and against others and the pride that they have. I want to read a comment on this scripture from Walt Key's commentary. And he says this, and it's so true. The proverb does not aim as much to define the mocker as to explain that his fury against God and humanity stems from his exaggerated opinion 
of his self-importance. When you see the mocker, keep this in mind and understand that the wrath and the mocking that is being dished out, it comes from the pride of the individual. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 65 and verse 5, Isaiah deals with the same thing. He says, which say, stand by thyself, come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. These are a smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day, a smoke in the nose of God. And we have to keep in mind that the holiness that we have, it comes from Christ. It comes from Christ. And for all of our actual holiness of obedience, that's a filthy rag before God as far as declaring us righteous at the throne. We have to have the imputed righteousness of Christ or we cannot make it. So we have to have both the imputed righteousness and we have to have the actual righteousness of obedience before the Father. So what do we do? And in Psalm chapter 119, and verse 51, this is exactly what we're going to do. This is another blessed text. As I say that about them all, don't I? But Psalm 119, verse 51. The proud have had me greatly in derision. Yet have I not declined from thy law. Have you ever been mocked? for just wanting to obey the Ten Commandments. I know that anyone that's done that for any length of time or has stood up for the Ten Commandments, you've been mocked. You've been made fun of. Oh, don't you know that's done away with? Oh, don't you know that that's the old stuff? Oh, don't you know that you're justified by faith and not works? And all of those little cliches that they throw at you and mock you and deride you. And what do we do? What do we do when the proud come against us for wanting to have just simple faith and obedience. I want to read uh, Thomas Manton's comment on this scripture. And Thomas Manton was another one of the Puritans. He said, They make a mock of reliance upon God. When we are in distress, think it ridiculous to talk of relief from heaven when earthly power faileth. They laugh me to scorn, saying he trusted in the Lord. The great promise of Christ's coming is flouted at by those mockers. There shall come in the last days mockers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? And that's what we do when we are mocked by those that mock us for obeying God's law. We just dig in and we make it much more our determination that we are going to walk in obedience and we are not going to swerve to the left hand or to the right. And William Gurnall talked about the loose unholy walker. And, you know, people talk about the skinwalkers. Well, this is something even more dangerous than the skinwalkers. This is the loose and the unholy walker. And Gurnall says, Christ came to destroy the works of the devil the loose, unholy walker, he goes about to destroy the work of Christ. And that's what these people do that teach these false doctrines of in, the false teaching of imputed righteousness, this false teaching that Christ obeyed for you and you don't have to obey. These are people that instead of destroying the works of the devil, they're destroying the works of Christ who came to give us that not only imputed righteousness but also imparted righteousness to give us a breastplate that is going to enable us to truly go into battle well we're going to take a break at this point and we're going to come back and we have a lot to say about being bold in battle for the lord so we will be right back in just a moment on the fojc remnant gathering <music> We have much to offer here on FOJCRadio.com. Most listeners are familiar with our radio page where we're live on Fridays at 6 p.m. Central Time 
And in, it includes our chat room where listeners can fellowship and read the scriptures that I post while Brother David's teaching. If you can't catch us live, we offer our podcast page with the latest audios of our remnant gatherings or the same audios are made into videos and now videos on two new video channels. The easiest way to find our new channels is to go to our ministry news page on FOJCRadio.com. On that page, you'll find links to our new channels uh, on Varidion and the Underground Church FOJC. And there's also links to our Doctrine of Christ series on Jimmy Vision and our Vault series. This makes it a lot easier for you to get the information with just a click. You'll find if there's going to be any events, we have that information on there. And we have um, a link to our free books and lots of other info. The latest info is on the ministry news page. I've tried to include answers to frequently asked questions on our Hot Topics page. We also try to help our listeners find local fellowship in their area with the Remnant Locations page. And for those who struggle with abuse issues, I offer my Ritual Abuse and Healing page. Our contact page has a short order form, some links for your love gifts, and of course, our contact information. On our resources page, you can find a list of our books, CDs, DVDs, free Bible studies, and tracts that can be printed or read. Check out our online Bible school or our music page. Both include easy-to-click audio files. And most important is our God Wants to Save You page. If you need help in leading someone to the saving mercy and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are plenty of uh, things to choose from on that page, including a little prayer that I wrote uh, to help lead people to accepting the Lord and inviting Him to be their Lord and Savior. It's all there, all free, so please use these many things that we offer on our website. We appreciate your support and have tried to make our site easy to navigate. But if you have a problem finding something, just email me at lastdayschurch at cs.com and I will be happy to help. Blessings to all our listeners and thanks again for your prayers and encouragement. Now back to tonight's message with Brother David Carrico on FOJC Radio. Welcome back to the FOJC Remnant Gathering. And as I always do after the break, I want to sincerely thank each and every one of you that studies with us and that prays with us and that supports us with your gifts and with your kindness. We do appreciate it so very, very much. Want to give a shout out to some new people in the chat tonight. We want to welcome you and uh, appreciate that. We always appreciate our folks in the chat. And uh, thank you so much. And we're going to get back into our study. And we're going to be looking in the book of Proverbs, chapter 20, verse 1. And I want to look at something here that Brother Gernal said. He said the breastplate, by defending this principal part, emboldens the soldier and makes him fearless of danger, and that is as necessary in fight as the other. It is almost all one for an army to be killed or cowed. And you just have to deal with fear and you you have to just have courage and our courage comes from our trust in the lord we have to believe that he is more than able to deal with any situation that we might find ourselves in and therefore we can go into battle because we are on the winning team oh yeah and we don't have to worry about that and in proverbs chapter 28 verse 1 
the wicked flee when no man pursueth. And the wicked, they'll get scared over a rumor or over something that isn't even real. And they'll start running when no one's even chasing them. But the righteous are bold as a lion. And we can be bold because we have on the breastplate of righteousness and when you have Christ imputed righteousness and when you are walking in a heart of love to obey the Father you're ready to go and you can go into battle and in Deuteronomy chapter 31 let's look at verses 5 through 7 and and the Lord shall give them up before your face that ye may do according unto them, that ye may do unto them according unto all the commandments which I have commanded you. Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. And these are the words of Moses as the children of Israel were getting ready to go in and confront the giants. And we know because of Moses' failure, he didn't get to go in. But he's encouraging them, be strong. You know, you can take them giants. And man, that's what we got, the attitude we got to have. Man, we can take these guys because the Lord is with us. We're, we can have courage and not fear because we've got the breastplate on. Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. And he will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. He certainly will not. He's not going to run out on us in a fight. And Moses called unto Joshua and said unto him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of a good courage, for thou must go with this people into the land which the Father has sworn unto their fathers to give them, and thou shalt cause them to inherit it. If we're going to receive that which the Father has for us, in this life and the next, we have to be strong. We have to be courageous. We have to be able to fight the enemy without fear. And he certainly will make this a reality for each and every one of his children. In verse 23 of Deuteronomy 31, it says, And he gave Joshua the son of Nun a charge and said, Be strong and of a good courage over and over the exhortation of Moses. For thou shalt bring the children of Israel into the land which I swear unto them, and I will be with thee. If there is a leader of an assembly that is a coward, how does anybody think he is going to lead them into anything but apostasy? In Revelation 21, 7, the cowards will be the very first people into the lake of fire. We have to get the breastplate on. We have to be without fear. We have to understand that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. First John 4 and 4. Romans eight thirty one. If God be for us, who can be against us? And it does not matter. In Joshua chapter 1, beginning in verse 7, when we are courageous and we have the breastplate of righteousness on, we can make choices that will enable us to engage the enemy and bring great victory. If you're a coward, you have no ability to make a choice in battle that's going to bring great victory. Let's read it in Joshua chapter 1, beginning in verse 6. Be strong and of a good courage. This is just over and over. For unto this people shalt thou divide, divide an inheritance, the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest pro prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then shalt thou make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. If you are not walking from a heart of love, in obedience to the Father in all things, you don't have a breastplate. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage? Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee 
whithersoever thou goest. This is why we don't need to be afraid and we can have courage because the Lord is with us. Now, if you're not walking in obedience, then the Lord is not with you and you're not going to be able to follow and you're not going to be able to have this courage. So you need to get that breastplate on, not only of imputed righteousness, but also of that imparted righteousness through the sanctification of the Spirit. In Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 15, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve. Yeah, and you know, this is the way it is, isn't it? Yeah, if, it, uh, if you don't really like the doctrine of Christ, just take a choice and pick something else and follow it and see how it works out for you. Uh, but you got to make a choice. People that are brave make choices. And when you make a choice to serve the Lord, you're going to separate yourself from other people. But it's straight ahead. It's, cur it's courage. It's boldness. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods of your fathers, whether the, the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And if you want to put up your Christmas tree, hey, go for it. But we're going to serve the Lord. We're not going to mess with that nonsense because the Lord is with us. And in the book of Joshua, chapter 5, let's look what happened when Joshua walked in obedience. In Joshua chapter 5, verse 13, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. It ain't about me being on your side or your enemy's side. It's about who's on my side because I'm the captain of the Lord of hosts and we're going to war here. So you can get your breastplate on and you can follow along or you can go do something else if that seems evil unto you. And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. And I believe that each and every one of us, when we are following that which the Lord has given us to do, when he brings us into that place where we are, that we are on holy ground. And I believe that about the Puritan barn. I believe he has led us here. And I believe this is holy ground because the Father has brought us us here and the Lord's the captain of the Lord's host who is Jesus himself he is fighting this fight for us we need not fear we need not be discouraged because the battle is the Lord's in first Kings eighteen twenty one, we see another one of God's mighty prophets challenging people to a decision and this is the big thing with people. They're, they're in an apostate church and, well, I just can't decide whether to get out or not. And they're just things that people are stuck in that they may need to make a decision to get out of. In 1 Kings 18, 21, And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? And that's where so many people are. They're double-minded. They're halted between two opinions. If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, not a word. And that's what people need to do. If, if, the, if the Lord is true, and if Jesus is right, and his words are true, follow him. If not, just do whatever you want to do. And there ain't no reason to try to persuade you. Because it is the Spirit of God within people's hearts that's going to lead them by the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in Jesus' own words, that the Holy Spirit will bring to our remembrance all things whatsoever that Christ has said unto us. This is what it's all about. So either serve Jesus or just go do something else. It's time to make a decision. And if you're halt between two opinions and you got one 
foot, and you this is just a, a metaphor, you can't do it, but if you've got one foot in with Christ and one foot in the world, whether you know it or not, you got both feet in the world. Stop halting between two opinions. It's too late to play games with a bunch of nonsense. In this chapter in 1 Kings 18, the tremendous courage of Elijah comes out and also the effects of fear. And I don't minimize fear. Um, we're facing some pretty scary things. And we're all human. And we all experience it to a measure. But yet, the Lord can enable us to replace fear with faith. And in 1 Kings 18, the same chapter where we see Elijah's challenge to those that are halt between two opinions, beginning in verse 7, it talks about Elijah's friend Obadiah. And as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him, and he knew him, and fell on his face, and said, Art thou that my lord Elijah? And he answered him, I am. Go and tell thy lord, Behold, Elijah is here. And that being Ahab. And he said, What have I sinned, that thou wouldest deliver thy servant into the hand of Ahab to slay me? I mean, he was struck with fear. You know, the command from a genuine prophet, Elijah was the real deal. And he said, Ahab, you need to go to Elijah and tell him I'm here. And Ahab and Obadiah just collapsed in fear. You see, we are going to have to do uh, some confronting of Ahab. And when we have to confront Ahab, we can't have our knees knocking together in fear. Down in verse 15, and Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts liveth, before whom I stand, I will surely show myself unto him today. Yeah, and there's so much in this phrase. It's Elijah said here, as the Lord of hosts liveth, before whom I stand. In Jeremiah, he said that these false prophets, if they would have stood in the counsel of the Most High and heard his words, they wouldn't be saying the nonsense that they are. And Obadiah was afraid, but Elijah had stood in the presence of God, and he said, I will surely show myself unto Elijah today. I will confront him, and I will do so without fear, because the Lord God before whom I stand, he has given me that command. And we will either stand in the presence of the Lord and go forth with the holy boldness to obey him, or we're going to have our knees knocking together in fear and our hearts failing us for fear for that which is a coming upon this earth. In verse 16, so Obadiah went to meet Ahab. You see, he overcome it. You see, the prophets have to encourage people to courage and not fear. You know, be courageous. Fear not. Get on your breastplate. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Obadiah got it. And after being completely afraid to obey, after the encouragement of Elijah, it says, so Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. It is not those believers that refuse to get vaccinated that are the enemies of the state. It's this ungodly, anti-Christ abomination of a government in this nation that wants to sanctify sodomy and every kind of other's rank perversion and wants to legitimize every stripe of abortion and evil, you're the ones that's troubling this nation. It's you, Joe Biden. It's you, Kamala. It's you, all of you snakes that are running this country that are going to bring the judgment of God on this land. It's not the, those believers that are standing firm in obedience to God's commandments. It's you, you barrel of snakes. William Gurnall had this to say on page 425. And I love it. There was another. Um, in 1666, <laughs> now that might be a prophetic number, mightn't it? That was the London Fire. And just about 
you can't make this up, but just about three and a half years before, there was the act of ejection that made the Puritans criminals and banned them from the pulpits in England. Three and a half years later, London burnt down. I mean, almost, look up the London fire in 1666. About three-fourths of London burnt to the ground. It was amazing. And Thomas Brooks, who was another one of my favorite Puritans. I got a few of them, you know. But he wrote a letter to the mayor of London, and it is a hoot. And he laid it out for him. You know, uh, you know why London burned down here, bright light? And he laid it out for him. You know, you persecuted the people of God. No wonder this place is burnt to the ground. Just wait till you see chapter 2 of this story. And that's the way it is. These people think that they can just run over the top of the people of God and just keep doing it and then do it again? Well, guess what? Uh, there's going to be an end to that one of these days. Um, on page 425, Gurnall said this, Holiness and righteousness, they are the pillars of kingdoms and nations. Who are they that keep the house from falling on a people's head but the righteous and a nation? Ten righteous men could they have been found in Sodom had blown over the storm of fire and brimstone that in a few hours entombed them in their own ashes. Yea, the destroying angel's hands were tied up as it were, but while one righteous lot was among them. What a thought. And I think today that in Israel... They need to read the story of Sodom and Gomorrah again. I think they forgot that one. But think about that. And that gives me great hope about here in the, in the Puritan barn and of the many people that really love God that are coming here. This is a tremendous opportunity for us to stand for faith and obedience. And just like the judgment of God was held off the area as long as the righteous were there, let there be found in Tell City. 10 and 50 and 100 righteous that will obey God without any compromise, that will stand bold with the breastplate of faith and righteousness and speak unto Ahab, you, you're the one that's troubling Israel. Repent and believe the gospel, for surely the time is drawing nigh. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 14, and let's look at verse 34. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And this is so true. And there is a reproach upon this nation that's called America, and there is reproach upon that nation that is called Israel that is not going to be wiped away by anything but the judgment of God. And if there are any that have ears to hear, it is time to repent and to absolutely throw yourself upon the mercy of a holy and righteous and merciful God. In Romans chapter 11, beginning in verse 2, God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew, Wot ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel? <laughs> now just think about that for a minute. We think about intercession, don't we? But Elijah was making intercession against Israel. Now, of course, that wasn't the real Israel of God, but that was the phony baloney Israel of God that he was making intercession against. Lord, they have killed my prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved unto myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. We have to remember that the mighty Elijah, and indeed he was one of the greatest of God's prophets, he had the courage to look Ahab in the face and said, you, you're the one that's troubling Israel. But yet one woman made him flee in fear, even to the point of despairing of his own life. And there's something really here that really applies to the remnant today. And of course, there's many great lessons for us in the scripture. But what was the thing that really beat Elijah down? It was isolation. He was fighting a fight 
he was fighting it brave and courageous but because there were nobody really around him and very few that would really encourage him uh, he felt so alone that fear got a hold of him and we have to understand that there's other people out there and if you have other people near you that will not bow the knee to Baal and if you can have those that are righteous that will gather together what a blessed wonderful thing my goodness that is so good but just remember that it's Christ's righteousness that puts the breastplate on us. It's not put on in the power of our flesh or the power of anything, but it's in the power of the Holy Spirit But that puts that on. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, and verse 3, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds what a phrase to faint in your mind we all know what it looks like when someone faints and they just collapse and sometimes our mind can faint and our mind will just collapse but we have to consider him Jesus Christ that endured such constant contradiction of the sinners the Pharisees the seed of Satan that come against him in his face saying you got a devil you got a devil the holy son of God walked in their midst they got in their face and told him he had a devil remember everything that he has suffered lest you faint in your mind when you think it's getting tough for you Consider Jesus. He's endured it all. And through considering that, we will not faint in our mind. I want to read John Owen's comment, another one of the Puritans, on um, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 3. And John Owen said this, that the malicious contradiction of wicked priests, scribes, and Pharisees against the truth and those that profess it on the account thereof is suited to make them faint if not opposed by the vigorous acting of faith on Christ and a due consideration of his sufferings in the same kind. We have to keep our faith in Jesus because faith in Jesus is what not only gives us imputed righteousness to begin with, but our faith in him is what gives us imputed righteousness each and every day of our walk with him. And always we have to remember everything that Jesus went through. And then we will be able not to faint in our minds. In the book of Second Samuel, in Second Samuel chapter 10 and verse 12, the scripture says here, Be of good courage and let us play the men for our people and for the cities of our God. And the Lord do that which seemeth him good. What a scripture. Yeah, let's play the men. Let's put our big boy pants on and let's put our big girl pants on and let's be strong for our city. Let's be strong for the people of God and let's just see what God will do. Yeah, let's read that again. Be of a good courage. How many times scripture tells us that? Be brave. Don't be a coward. Be of good courage and let us play the man for our people and for the cities of our God for the Lord do and the Lord do that which seemeth him good. And you absolutely can believe that he will. And I want to read another scripture here, and uh, I want to look at uh, the book of James, chapter 2 and verse 10, and I think we'll probably close with that. Um, the book of James, chapter 2 and verse 10. Okay, it says here, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Now I want to read Adam Clark's comment on that and kind of have this for our closing thought. Because you can have a big hole knocked in your breastplate and that hole is put there 
by unrepentant sin. And the guilt of unrepentant sin is the biggest door that the devil has. He's the accuser of the brethren. And sometimes, you know, uh, when the devil's accusing you and he says, well, look, you've done this and that, sometimes you just have to agree with him and say, yeah, you're right, but I'm going to repent, and I'm going to close that door. And Adam Clark said concerning James 2.10, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. He had this to say. The truth is, any sin against the divine authority and he who has committed one transgression is guilty of death. Now, sin, and you see, here's the problem. People don't understand what sin is because 1 John 3, 4 says sin is the transgression of the law, and when you throw the law out, you have no parameters to define sin about whatever you think sin is. But sin is the transgression of the law, and when you knowingly and willfully transgress the law, you die. Ezekiel 18 and 4, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Romans 3, 20, or excuse me, 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Going on here, uh, and you know, this is something, boy, uh, that are once saved, always saved people that say, well, you mean you can be sent to, to hell for one sin? I say, absolutely you can. And I will ask them, how many children do you have to molest to go to hell? Is it the second one you molest that will send you to hell? Maybe it's not till the third, the fourth, the fifth. How many times do you have to commit adultery to go to hell? Is it you don't go to hell the first time you do it, it'll be maybe number five or six. Sin is the transgression of the law, and sin kills. This is absolutely true. And those that walk in the fear of God keep themselves from willful transgression of God's law. And this does not seem unreasonable to them, because they don't want to break God's law. So this, you know, I, but anyway, going on here, I'm going to read some more of what Brother Clark said. He said, and by his one deliberate act, dissolves as far as he can the sacred connection that subsists between all the divine precepts and the obligation which he is under to obey. Now here again, we just lost the modern American church. We were talking about covenant, covenanted obedience on our DOC last week. We are in a covenant. That means God does something and we have obligations to do something too. This is something that is just total foreign to people today that profess Christ. We are under the obligation to obey God, and when we willfully transgress his law, we die. He says, and thus casts off, in effect, his allegiance to God. For if God should be obeyed in any one instance, he should be obeyed in all, as the authority and reason of obedience are the same in every case. He, therefore, who breaks one of these laws is, in effect, if not in fact, guilty of the whole. And this is just so absolutely true. And this should not be a burdensome thing to anyone that loves the Lord and wants to fulfill the law through faith. And, you know, it is just, uh, it's with a heavy heart that I see so many people that have paper mache breastplates on, but it's with a heart of joy that I see people putting on the real breastplate of righteousness and getting ready to go into battle. And it's with a heart of great joy that I see so many of those fine warriors that are getting closer and closer to me all the time. And certainly I believe the Lord is putting together an army. So I just want to thank each and every one of you for joining us on the FOJC Remnant Gathering this evening. And um, tomorrow night on the Midnight Ride, I'll be doing a teaching on the false shepherds of the apocalypse. And this will be kind of a segue off the 70 shepherds of Enoch teaching and it's going to be looking into Bible prophecy about things that 
they could just happen any time. We need to be aware of what these scriptures say and be looking for them. So we thank you so much. We love and appreciate each and every one of you. We really do, and the Lord does too. Thank you for your love for him and for your love for us. So until next Friday night, 6 p.m. Central, on the FOJC Remnant Gathering, we will see you then. God bless you all. Thank you for listening and joining in fellowship with us here at FOJC Radio Remnant Gathering. You can contact us at FOJC Post Office Box 671 Tell City, Indiana 47586 or you can email us at lastdayschurch at cs.com or you may call us at 812 812- Eight three six two two eight eight. You can check out our website at www.fojcradio.com. Thanks and God bless.